Hi there, my name is Jenny Gibson. I am a senior university practitioner at the University of Huddersfield and I am here today to give you a taster session on the components of a magazine cover. This is something that our second year students um, do as part of their module on magazine design and production. So I hope you enjoy this and I hope it's useful to you. Let me share my screen with you. OK. So by the end of the session, you are going to know more about what all the different components of a magazine cover are called, what they're there for, how um, editorial teams at magazines decide what's going to go on the cover of their magazine each issue, um, and how all those components work together to make a really um, enticing um, whole of the cover. OK, so there are six things that we're going to be looking at, the mass head, the strap line, cover lines, the barcode, which seems like a small thing, but it's very important. We're going to be um, talking about anchorage and we'll come on to that. Um, and then we're going to be thinking in detail about the cover image and the importance of picking the right picture. OK, so there are four stages of buying a magazine. This is when um, you, you, you're thinking about the um, the news agent stands in the supermarket, that kind of very shouty environment where there are an awful lot of titles vying for your attention as a consumer, as a reader. So the first thing that happens is that you see that magazine, it, it catches your eye, okay? The second thing is you might pick it up to take a closer look. If you're able to, you might have a flip through that magazine, um, the way that magazines are bagged sometimes, um, perhaps if there are flyers in the magazine or some sort of supplementary um, section or um, if there's a free gift on the cover that makes it difficult you can't always flip through a magazine can you in a shop um, and then the final stage is that you are moved to buy that magazine you take it to the till and you part with your three four five pound however much it costs okay so the cover is um, the main method of enticing a shopper in OK, and every other cover in this very crowded environment is trying to do the same thing. So a cover of a magazine works really hard. Research has shown that a magazine's cover has got 2.5 seconds to grab somebody's attention. That's not very long, is it? OK, and there's essentially two things that the cover has to do. First of all, it has to sell the concept of the magazine, the essence of that magazine, the unique personality of that magazine. OK, this is the sort of stuff that makes um, a readership very loyal. Secondly, it's got to reflect um, what's in the inside pages of the magazine. Really important that it does this accurately because if it doesn't a, um, and somebody buys the magazine, if it's not what they expected, they can feel cheated, they can feel chart changed, they can feel very disappointed. So it's really important that those things match up. Um, in terms of, you know, what is a good thing to put on the cover? Well, that depends on the magazine, doesn't it? So it might be um, an up and coming celebrity. It might be a really big name. Um, can be a massive fish, can't it? If it's a fishing magazine, um, that's going to do the trick. Sometimes it's a model just with the right look. Um, if it's a camera magazine, it can be, you know, the kind of the latest gadget. Really depends on the magazine, on the genre. Okay. So quite often editorial teams, um, they will look to put celebrities on the cover. We're talking about celebrity um, consumer magazines now. They will look to put celebrities on the cover who embody the essence of the magazine, OK? So if that magazine was a person, they might be that celebrity. Good housekeeping is a really great example of that. This is a, you know, a best-selling um, mass market magazine for, um, for women, really, of a certain age, OK? So you can see a lot of celebrities here who would, um, you know, meet the aspirations of their readers. So you've got various people here, actresses, um, Nigella, the TV cook, um, Michelle Obama, um, Claire Baldwin, the presenter, you know, they all are really kind of all really strong, successful women in their own fields. And, you know, they're all um, celebrities that their readership would really relate to. OK. When deciding what goes on the cover, sometimes something new or surprising or even unexpected can work really well. Um, 
an exclusive interview is always good. That BBC Doctor Who magazine in the middle, um, their interview with Jodie Whittaker, the current Doctor Who, is branded there as an exclusive interview, which suggests to you that if you want to read an interview with Jodie Whitt Whittaker, this is the only place you can do that. You need to buy that magazine. Um, something surprising, Attitude magazine, that's uh, a title for gay men. You wouldn't necessarily expect Prince William to be on the front of there. Um, so again, you know, something a little bit different. Usually they have um, a prominent um, gay celebrity on the front of that title. OK, so, yes, yeah, something, you know, shocking imagery there. You can see that German uh, news magazine there on the left. Um, yeah, something a bit different and attention grabbing often works very well. Um, magazines have long used controversy um, as a, uh, a trigger to um, encourage people in to get people interested that image in the middle of the actress did me more it looks very um tame now doesn't it you know there's you know we quite often see um really classy photography of pregnant women pregnant celebrities like that don't we but at the time it was really shocking they had to put it in a brown paper bag it got everybody talking and it paid off for them because it made vanity fair feel very um edgy and a bit different um, you can see a couple of other examples there of controversial, impactful magazine covers of through the ages. There's an, a really famous cover there from 1968 with Muhammad Ali. Um, that was really controversial at the time. People thought it was blasphemous because he's striking a, a pose that emulates uh, Jesus there. Um, so um, a controversial cover that didn't pay off. This one on the right with for OK magazine. Um, on the death of Michael Jackson. Um, so all the other magazines, you know, they had really nice pictures of Michael Jackson in his prime um, as tribute. Um, but OK Magazine, they decided to, um, you know, publish these sort of quite upsetting, quite harrowing last pictures of Michael Jackson. And, it, you know, they said that they did it because they wanted to be different. Um, but they got an awful lot of backlash from that. And it took them um, a while to rebuild their reputation as a magazine brand. So it doesn't. So taking a risk doesn't always pay off, um, and this is the skill of the editor and their team to, um, you know, to to decide what's going to work well for them and what isn't. They've got to kind of pick a strategy and go with it. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. More impactful covers here. Time magazine, the um, international current affairs title. You know, they are really well known for um, having an extremely strong brand, impactful covers, sometimes controversial covers. OK, so they're a really good example to study. I just want to talk a bit about the editorial process now, about how um, journalists decide what is going to be on a cover um so if let's say that it's a monthly magazine you'll find that deals are done between publicists representing celebrities and the magazine staff so the magazine might say okay we'll put your celebrity on the cover um if they don't do any other magazine covers this month if this is an exclusive interview to us and if they talk exclusively to us about um you know something perhaps um something perhaps sort of personal or different or that they've not talked about before, something that's maybe a little bit confessional in some way, something that's going to um, encourage readers to um, sit up and take notice, okay? On the other hand, the publicist might say to the magazine, okay, we'll grant you this interview with our celebrity if you don't ask them about that thing they don't want to talk about, that thing that's a bit tricky, um, like, for example, the fact that they have been... Um, you know, they've been to rehab or they've been caught um, and convicted for drink driving or something like that. Um, the publicist might say, um, yes, we'll grant you this interview, but you have to put them on the cover and you have to promote this new book that they've got out or a film or whatever. OK, they might also say um, we want copy approval. That means that um, they the they, um uh, the celebrities' representatives, they want to see what you're writing about them um, before it goes in the magazine. Same with picture approval, they want to choose the flattering images. So, you know, sometimes there are deals being struck like this. Um, and sometimes, you know, um, 
within the uh, editorial team, um, a magazine, you know, they might have an idea at the start of the month who is going to be on the cover and they might get a better offer. So that might change part way, you know, part way through the month, if that makes sense. Um, so these things are always very movable. OK, so moving on to the components of a cover, then I said we'll be covering six key components. The first one is the masthead. Now, if we were in a classroom now, I'd be saying to you, which bit is the masthead? And hopefully you will be pointing out to me that the masthead is the title of the magazine. And this is really important um, because it's the first thing that the reader sees. It's always um, or generally placed at the top of the page, isn't it? Because, you know, if you're looking at magazines on a newsstand, you don't see the full cover, do you? You see the top half quite often. Um, the masthead also doubles up as the, bra the logo of the magazine as well. And, it, you know, it must embody the, the essence of the magazine. It must sort of say something about that magazine and its style and its values. Um, it's got to be right for the audience. In journalism, that is really important, making sure that um, everything that you do is really geared towards appealing to a particular and very precisely um, defined audience. OK. Um, Mastheads are, you, you know, quite often just one word. So if you look at Vogue magazine there, um, that masthead works really well because it's just a five letter word so that you can have it quite big at the top of the magazine. That's not always the case, but quite often, quite often um, it's just a sort of a short, sharp one word title. OK, so a little bit of a more difficult question now. Second component, where is the strap line? So if we were in a classroom again, you'd be having a point about this. I'm just going to point it out to you. So the strap line is the part of the cover that just kind of um, gives you a little bit more detail about what this magazine is in case you're in any doubt. So this is Perfect Wedding magazine and it, the strap line tells you that it's the UK's best selling monthly bridal mag. So that gives you more confidence as a reader that this is the title for you. So you're thinking, right, OK, so it's best. It's the it's the one that sells the most. It must be OK. Let, let's part with this two pounds ninety nine. Town and Country magazine there, um, the strap line is the best of both worlds. This is quite um, a high end aspirational magazine for um, people who like to spend time in the city. They're interested in fashion and culture and lifestyle, but they also love the country as well. So, you know, hence the horse and the field on the cover with the actress Lily James there. OK, um, not all magazines have um, a strap line. So Empire magazine, which is a really well known and well established um, movie magazine, they don't have a strap line because, well, sometimes they do. Sometimes they carry a strap line, sometimes they don't. Um, but that shows confidence in the magazine brand that they uh, are, you know, um, pretty sure that their readers know who they are without them having to be um, told or reminded are expanded upon um, in a strap line. So you don't have to have a strap line on your cover. OK, my next question, where are the cover lines? Similar similar title there, isn't it, to a, a, a strap line? A cover line is a bit of a different thing. OK. So a cover line is um, uh, you know, a little teaser, really, a trailer of some of the interior content of the magazine. Um, some magazines have a lot of cover lines, some don't have any at all. There are no cover lines on Stylist there. It's quite interesting, isn't it? There's just one main headline. There are no sort of smaller cover lines anywhere else. Um, that shows that um, Stylist is kind of very confident as a brand. The brand enough is enough to make you um, pick up that magazine from, um, well, it's free actually, is Stylist. You pick it up in, in railway stations, bus stations, places like that, public places. I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, so maybe because um, you don't have to um, put your hands in your pockets to get the Stylist, maybe they feel they don't have to try as hard with the cover lines. Okay. Um, cover lines are sometimes called cell lines or teaser lines, as I said there. Um, they're there to um, tell you what's inside the magazine. So even if, you know, the cover star isn't, some, uh, isn't a celebrity that, or a story that appeals to you, there might be some cover lines that catch your eye. OK, the idea of these is to encourage you to reach forward and pick up that magazine. Um, 
So I have a couple of questions here. So again, if we were together in a room, I'd be saying, why do you think some magazines have a lot of cover lines and why do some have few or none? Now I touched on why some have few or none, because sometimes um, magazine designers, you know, especially if it's quite a posh high end magazine, they like to keep the cover very clean and clear. OK. Um, some magazine covers have a very busy feel. So if you look at the soap magazines, some of the celebrity gossip magazines, there are loads of cover lines on there. Loads of chances for you as a potential reader to see something that you like the look of that you want to find out more about. OK, so what makes a good cover line? OK, so we're back to good housekeeping again here. So most cover lines are very positive and enthusiastic in tone. Um, cover lines need to be short and to the point, OK, because you've only got a minute to get somebody's attention. They've got to be big enough to see from two or three metres away. So that's if you know you're in the supermarket with your trolley or in the shop and you're walking past. And the idea is that you don't have to be right in front of a magazine for you to be able to spot something that catches your eye in those cover lines. OK, quite often cover lines use numbers. Um, you can see this this on this uh, example that I've given you here. The, um, what's it say there? 25 pages of food. 10 key fashion buys to make you feel amazing. OK, sometimes cover lines are in boxes or circles to break up the design of the um, cover, make it more interesting. OK, the next thing now. Um, is the barcode. This You might think this is quite a minor thing, but it's really important, isn't it? If, um, you know, uh, if a magazine is in a shop, it's got to be scanned at the tail, hasn't it? So the, um, the checkout operator needs to be able to easily find the barcode to scan the magazine. So there you go. There are a couple of barcodes on the front of covers there. Um, on the right is a magazine that doesn't have a barcode. This is the um, supermarket magazine that you pick up in Asda. Uh, it gives you ideas for recipes, um, general bits of lifestyle features, that sort of thing. Um, that doesn't have a barcode because it's free. OK, so it doesn't need to be scanned. So that you know, magazines don't always carry a barcode. OK. Bit more of a, um, an interesting, um, an interest, well, they're all interesting concepts. A bit more of a, an involved concept here. What is anchorage? Anchorage is there to um, kind of balance out the cover, I suppose, because you've got some heavy text at the top in terms of the masthead. The anchorage is, um, you know, kind of a larger piece of text towards the bottom of the page to kind of balance things out so the magazine doesn't sort of feel top heavy. Um, and it usually takes the form of a main headline. You can see a magazine in German on the left, by the way. So everywhere in the Western world, magazine design follows the same convention. We're not just talking about the UK here. Um, so in the middle there, that's a magazine about uh, portable toilets. OK, so in the weird and wonderful world of trade magazines, you know, there are all sorts of very specialist titles and I'm here to tell you that there's more than one uh, magazine devoted to um, the portable toilet industry. OK, so the anchorage is here on each of these titles. It's the main headline on the page. OK. So every, you know, every edition, journalists who work for a magazine, they will pick their, um, you know, most prominent uh, cover story, the most prominent bit of content in that magazine and put that kind of center stage in the middle of the cover and give it a really snappy headline um on the camera magazine you know it's a really kind of straightforward headline it does what it says on the till it's telling you on the tin it tells you that um this is you know that there's a feature here about best cameras under 700 pounds okay sometimes it's a quote from a, a an interviewee sometimes it's some a play on words okay all right, so last but not least in terms of components of a cover, the cover image, this is really important. Um, so why is it important? Okay, 
The cover image is really key because it's the main draw to the magazine. If I showed you a bunch of magazine covers, well, I have been showing you a bunch of magazine covers. I bet you wouldn't remember some of the titles of those magazines, some of the mastheads. I bet you wouldn't remember the cover lines, but I bet you can think of some of the celebrities that you've seen in this presentation already. Yeah, am I right? Um, so the celebrity is ideally more recognisable than the magazine brand. Um, that always bodes well for a magazine. If you've got a big name on your cover, it shows that you're an important title, um, that you're able to um, secure high profile interviews. Yeah, OK. Um, and the, the, um, the, the image is there to reflect the magazine genre as well. The magazine essence again, I keep using this word essence, the unique personality of the magazine. OK, so my next question then is what makes a good cover image? OK, so we've talked about celebs, celebrities that are what you would call totes target for the magazine brand. OK, um, cover images are usually sort of quite clear and simple, not too crowded. Um, you, if it's a, a person, you've usually got them fill in the frame. Usually that model or that celebrity is making eye contact with the reader. OK, usually the eyes are there in the top half of the cover. And that's not always a, the case, though. You know, some magazines, sometimes um, designers will try to do something a bit different. Again, great way of catching people's attention. Um, so here's GQ magazine with a sort of a, co a COVID edition with a smiley face on it. Usually see, you see a sort of a prominent male celebrity on the front of GQ. Not this time. Very different. Um, the other uh, image I have on this slide is Sports Illustrated. This is um, a, a sports magazine um, and that image is from the Boston Marathon and the, the bombing that happened there. And, you know, it was a really shocking event for the world and for that sports community particularly. So that cover breaks all of the conventions. There's uh, three police officers there. There's a runner on the ground. Um, nobody's looking at the camera. It's a very busy image, but um, because of um, you know the kind of the shocking nature of um, of what happened that day, um, that was a really impactful cover. It worked really well. You can see there are no cover lines on that cover because that would um, that would almost sort of um, suggest you know kind of go to lessen the impact of the magazine. Okay, so clearly you know in that in that sports community at that time this was the one thing that everybody was talking about and to put cover lines down the side would cheapen that okay so yeah before we finish i just want to show you some of our own students work at the university of huddersfield these are some re recent covers that our students have made um so in that module that i mentioned to you our students devise and deliver a complete concept for a new magazine they research the audience they think about the look and the design they think about the content they think about how that magazine will be printed and distributed etc etc so here are some sample covers so um uh, the one on the right there, that the concept of unedited magazine was uh, bringing um, Instagram influencers um, into print. OK, so bloggers, influencers, vloggers who have made their, ma their name in social media. The idea was to sort of bring those big names into a magazine format. Very different, very current. Um, so Beat magazine there, that was a, a makeup magazine for young adults. Compass, that was uh, food and travel. And then um, Destination Dernier Cree on the left, that was um, a high-end magazine devised by a group of students, um, combining fashion and travel and, to, and with an international feel to be sold at airports. So some very different concepts there, just gives you a little insight into what we do at Huddersfield. Okay, so then to sum up, we have talked about six big components of a magazine cover. You now know more about them. You know what they're called. You know what they're there for. You know why they're important. Um, and you know how they work together. OK, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed that and found it useful.